Hey, so it's the last week or so of August 2022, and August um, 9th was the one-year anniversary of my diagnosis, which I mentioned in my last video. Uh, but I didn't really talk too much about, you know, what that was like. So I thought I would just kind of elaborate a little bit and maybe go back and watch a few of my videos and just kind of see how I feel about what I'm looking at. So that's what's going to be in this one. So first, I'll just tell you, there was no way for me to not recognize the year when it came. Um, I had been teaching for two weeks of my semester when I went in the hospital. So here we are exactly one year later, the following fall, and I'm coming to school and I'm like, in two weeks is my anniversary. So there was just no way to not know. And coming up to that, I had a lot of feelings. You know, I've mentioned having post-traumatic stress, you know, subclinical, not something diagnosable. I would say probably the vast majority of people who deal with any kind of significant illness are going to have some kind of post-traumatic stress. But cancer is kind of like there's two sides of a coin with cancer as compared to some other illnesses. So on one side, there's the benefit that there are a lot of options for care in both the Western, Eastern, and other natural types of healing. It's a, people know what cancer is. And also on the good side, the world pretty much knows that cancer is relatively devastating. And on the other side of that coin is that when more people know about it, it's kind of minimized in some ways. And some people are just like, yeah, whatever, cancer, or hey, you've got the good cancer, which nobody said to me, thank God. Um, there's no good cancer. So if you're watching this and you thought you might say that to somebody like, hey, your cancer is not the bad kind, don't say it. Don't say that. All cancer is life-threatening. And yeah, I mean, I guess that's the thing. I don't think anybody comes out of cancer unscathed. And then, you know, comparing it to other illnesses, you know, when you're looking at things like Epstein-Barr, Lyme disease, lupus, and probably, you know, some MS, things that people can't see and really don't know that much about interstitial cystitis and may or may not be life-threatening, but definitely life-altering. You know, nobody with any of those diagnoses, once symptoms hit a certain level, their life is different. And the thing about it is when you say like lupus to somebody, they maybe have heard of it, <clears throat> you know, or, or chronic fatigue syndrome or something like that. It's hard for people to understand what it is. So it's just harder in its own way than many forms of cancer, because even in the world of medicine, no matter what kind of medicine, it's harder to treat. It's just different. Long-term, I guess I'd say it's definitely long-term treatment. Cancer's long-term treatment, too. kind of depends on what kind. So anyway, I just wanted to kind of put that out there and tell you, you know, what I've been thinking about. And so a friend of mine who has been, like, at my side this whole time, who did deal with illness for a very long time, actually two of those illnesses that I mentioned, she was diagnosed with, um, along with, you know, every other symptom getting diagnosed when she, you know, was treated in allopathy. Um, when I called her uh, on the one-year anniversary of really my second day in the hospital, I told her what she said to me. I was like, do you remember what you said to me? And she said, no. And I said, of course, because you're so wonderful in the moment. She said to me, and I think this is really good for anybody dealing with illness to hear. She said, the doctors and your medical team, they're going to have this lingo, this language that they speak in the world of diagnosis and symptoms and staging. And she said, don't worry yourself with any of that. All of that is so that they can have simplicity in talking about your case. It has no bearing on whether or not you get better. So don't worry yourself with it. And so I didn't. That sounded really real and true to me. And what does staging really mean? It's just a way for them to talk about it and simplify the talking about it. You know, that's what it is. And what is diagnosis? It simplifies the way that they talk about it. They're in their notes and talking to each other and, you know, grading where you are so that they can know where you are and they can do their job. There's people, stage four cancer, that reverse it. So just let the medical establishment talk about you the way they need to, but don't put too much weight on it for yourself. It doesn't mean you ignore that you got something going on in your body. Take care of what you need to take care of. Don't get hung up on it. Okay, so I just opened my YouTube channel. 
and I'm just going to record what I'm watching and then I'll comment on it as we go. So first I, I feel a little emotional just opening this up and seeing the, um, the thumbnails, some of them. Okay, so got my YouTube channel open. I'm just scrolling down. I'm going to my first video, the one I recorded in the hospital. So I am in the hospital. I am here on my third day. I came on Monday morning at 3.30 with severe abdominal pain that I had experienced on and off for about a week. On Sunday it became unbearable and nothing I did gave me any relief. It was a 10. And came to the ER and um, so I was only having abdominal pain for a week. I was trying to remember how long it was. I knew it wasn't very long. Um, I could feel the mass for longer, uh, but there was no pain. Long story short, found out that my gallbladder's fine, stomach's fine, large intestine's fine, but I have a large mass growing. And <clears throat> they suspected cancer and said, just the way it looks, it's suspicious, but we'll do a biopsy. And so that day, um, they moved me from the ER up to a room, did a biopsy. I had already had two CAT scans by the time I got up here and a sonogram. Um, let's see, was it the same day? Biopsy, two CT scans. Oh, and that night they took me for an MRI at 10 p.m. Um, next day was really just waiting for results, trying to figure out a plan, have an oncologist, have um, the regular doctors here, everybody's communicating, that part's amazing. And uh, today they took me for a port because they're, fit, they're sure that it's a lymphoma or a cancer at least and they want to do chemo and what they're suspecting is lymphoma. Just hearing myself say chemo right there, I had a reaction, like internal. And I just had no idea what was coming. Okay, I'm going to keep going. Um, <clears throat> and got the results back. It is lymphoma. It's a very treatable kind. Uh, so there's good news and the bad news. And it took me for a bone marrow um, biopsy as well. We don't have the results for that. I just did that today. Um, so it's Wednesday. And I just wanted to make um, a video record of, of that part of my journey. Um, the plan is chemo every three weeks for six cycles. I'm not 100% sure if that means chemo one day, chemo, and then in three weeks chemo again, or is it chemo for a few days and then three weeks off and then chemo for a few days or something like that, I don't really know. So my first two rounds were R-CHOP and I got it all in one day. <clears throat> and the following day I had an injector that was on my body that I got the day that I got chemo, and 24 hours later, or 25 or something, I can't remember the exact number, it would inject me with a bone marrow booster called Nelasta. So that was Monday and Tuesday. Well, the first cycle was Friday the 13th, and then I had to go the following week for a different kind of booster. I had to get a shot five days in a row, and then my second round, we had to wait a little bit, like an extra week or four days or five days or something on the insurance to approve a particular drug, which they approved a drug. They just didn't have it in that pharmacy, so they had to order it. And, um, and then my second RCHOP started my cycles on Mondays. Monday, all day, got the new last injector placed. The next day, it injected me. Now, on both of those cycles, my worst day was the seventh day sometimes the eighth day. Round three, 
through 6 were called our epoch. Added ad, ad, at the addition of one drug called cytoxan, and I'm I'm saying it that way so you can kind of hear the the spelling of it, C Y T O X A N cytoxan. And so instead of getting it all in one day, I would get the sort of associated drugs through IV and some pushes. Um, and that was only like maybe half a day, like four to five hours. And then I would have attached to my port a bag that was putting the chemo drugs in over the next 24 hours. And right now, as I'm telling you, I remember what that was like. I would hear the pump. Go and I remember the first time feeling every time I heard that sound, it was like I got more nauseous. And I probably literally did get more nauseous. But I was adding to it because of the emotional connection of I'm slowly putting toxins in my body. And the next day I would go and get the bag changed. The next day I get the bag changed. And then on Friday, I would just do Monday to Tuesday to Wednesday to Thursday. And then Friday, they would take the bag off and give me one drip of the cytoxin. And I remember that after cytoxin, my voice was different. After the very first time. And I got the new last injector placed. And then on Saturday, I would get injected. This is what's interesting. The seventh day was still the worst day, maybe the eighth day. But it would be after I got that new last injector on Saturday night, in the morning on Sunday, I just felt like so much pain in my body and discomfort. It was like having the flu, but just the aches, really bad, maybe worse than your typical flu. And my first drink in the morning, the first couple times I would forget. And on that, the day after new last, I would go to take a sip like drink water, and it would hurt so bad. Now, we do have um, some white, uh, some, come on, brain. What's the ring of, in the throat? There's a immune system ring. It's like the tonsils and Byers patches. I don't know. That's not right. I don't know. I don't remember what they're called. But there's like a ring there, and I thought that maybe that's why, or maybe it's my lymph nodes here or something like that, but my throat would be, so, like my first sip would be so hard. And then it took me a couple cycles, and then I finally would go, okay, I'll just, I'll just take a tiny sip to start, and that made it a little easier. And the other thing was, I probably noticed this on the first two rounds, but it got a lot worse on the last four. If I leaned over to pick something up, I would get this massive surge into my head which would be almost painful. Now on rounds five and six, I didn't have to bend over for that to happen. I just got up on that seventh day. I remember going to the couch on both of those and just sitting down and thinking, this really hurts. Like I had this pain going up like inside my head all the way up to the top, more on the right than the left. And sometimes it would be both sides. Now that was without bending or leaning or anything. I was just sitting. And the sixth round, I had that so bad when I woke up on the seventh day and um, chemo kind of numbed me out for that first week, and then it became painful and uncomfortable, and that's when I took Percocet. But on that day, I would just take up, wake up and take Percocet. I always wanted to wait, wait as long as possible because it would really, once it really took effect, it only lasted about four hours. And it would get like the periphery first, so if I had like pain in my legs or something, it would kind of handle that. But there was this internal something with the chemo, I, I called it discomfort in my videos, but pain wasn't the right word. I don't know what to call it. I guess pain, I don't know, just felt bad. The Percocet would eventually get to that, and that's what it was for. That's, Percocet made it bearable. But on that sixth round, I sat on the couch that day and thought, this might be the last day that I'm here. I was in such a weird and hard pain to deal with. It was just going up into my head. I'm like, am I gonna stroke out today? Maybe. And because chemo numbed me, I just, what was I going to do? I mean, if I start feeling worse, I'll go to the hospital, I guess. And that went away the next, it started waning noticeably the next day. And by the third day of round six, it was done. And so, yeah, that's just, I didn't, at the time of this video, I didn't know what was coming. The doctor did tell me verbally the chemos that it would be, but I, my brain doesn't know any of that, but I'm getting three chemo drugs. Wait, One um, bone marrow uh, producer or supporter makes you produce bone marrow. 
and three steroids all at the same time. Steroids suck. So that made me think, I come in, I do all of that, and then I can go home and then come back in three weeks and do it again for six cycles. I'm going to fast forward a little bit. More, but this just feels like a lot. Got this port right here. It's all bandaged up. This stays on for like 48 hours, no showering, and then takes like a week to heal. Uh, I do, of course, you know. Or in the hospital, um, yeah. things are moving along. Yeah, I was really supposed bad. to get transferred. Well, I got the PET scan today, and that's to check all the lymph nodes. <laughs> Fixing my, my hair. <laughs> what you gonna do? I say, don't shower for 48 hours. Crazy. <laughs> okay. Uh, PET scan today. Had to take some medication for pain so I can lay flat on my back. When I lay flat on my back, I have abdominal pain that refers to my back. And even if it, the pain I could consider mild, it's like an intolerable kind of pain. Yeah. Like sandpaper on a nerve. Mixed with fire and ice. That's what it felt like. <laughs> now, at this point, it was a little bit less, and I, I'm not sure if it just flared up before I went in the hospital or what, but they did give me a Percocet on the first day, and that helped a lot. And then they gave me hydrocodone. It's like less oxy. So it's like a lower dose, but I would have to take two of those. I was just trying to take one, but if I had to lay flat, like for the PET scan, I just couldn't. It was just so uncomfortable. And even during that PET scan, I remember being like, I, I can't wait for this to be over. It was okay at first, and then after I laid there, I was just like, oh, it's just nerve pain. And I, there's nothing like nerve pain. And it's similar to the pain I had coming in, but the pain I had coming in was definitively a 10. If I could go higher than a 10, I would. And when I try to compare any other pain to that 10, I, ne I guess I never understood what a 10 was before. Even my back pain when it was a 10 wasn't like this. Um, and my back pain was a 10, for real. It was just short-lived, like maybe a seconds, you know, 30 seconds, a minute, at that level of pain. And then it just ached at like a 7 or 8. But this pain that got me in the hospital, relentless. Luckily, I haven't really had that pain since I've been here. Not a 10, anyway. Um, just a little bit when I lay in certain positions because the lymphoma is in my inner spell. So glad for that. So grateful. Ah. So it's still day four. It's close to midnight. Um, I'm, in, I'm in the new hospital where the chemo is done. I'm in Advent Health Altamont. Today I came over on this side of town for an inpatient PET scan. Don't have the results yet. Don't have the bone marrow results yet. But I do have news about what's going on tomorrow. So sometime early in the morning, I'm going to have a tube connected to the port. And then um, <laughs> sometime daytime. I got to tell you about the nurse that cleaned it and put my, uh, and accessed my port. So the nurse that I had, she was so great. Oh my gosh. I prayed for a great medical team on every account and I got it on every account. You know, I got everything that I needed. It was so interesting. Um, and I consistently prayed for that, and I prayed for everybody in my medical team, even people I didn't know, like people in admin and people who picked up trash. I was just like, anybody who has any connection to this, just bless them. And um, I really, I hope that it, it came through for them. Um, but the nurse that I had was so great. She told me, we used to give people these, like, kits and stuff, and she's like, I don't think we have them anymore. And then she's like, I'm going to go look for one. She came in with, like, a drink cup and, like, a, a bag of her shoulder, like, modeling it. And I was like, gosh, I was worried that, you know, the staff and, and the nursing team and stuff here might not be as great as the other one. They were just as good. And um, the lady who came to access my port, so accessing the port means putting a needle in and then covering it, and it stays in. And that's how they give the chemo. So at first, because my, my, it really wasn't healed. It didn't heal for two weeks. And I just had the port placed two days before. But you could access the port immediately after putting it in. Um, so this lady comes and wakes me up at like four in the morning. 
and she's like, oh, good morning. And she was like, bubblier than I can ever portray to you. I mean, just like a happy, really bubbly voice and just like, oh my gosh, I, I'm, I'm sorry. This is so cold. I have to rub this on your skin for two minutes. Okay. Just hold, bear with me. And I was just like, just do what you got to do. And then I saw my nurse later in the day and I was like, hey, the nurse that accessed my port, she's like, hey. I was like, if I can't do it, I'm sending her. And I was like, yeah, for four in the morning and cancer and all this shit, that was a good choice. She was really, really kind. So I'm going to, um, actually, let me finish this video. I, I feel like I need it. Um, could be morning, could be afternoon. I'll get the first uh, chemo medication. I started at 7 p.m. on Friday the 13th. And it went until probably four or five in the morning on Saturday the 15th, um, 14th. And because they didn't need to rush, there were some medications that their instructions were things like observe the patient for 30 minutes. If there's no reaction, you can increase the flow. And so I had nurses sitting with me on a couple of those just staying in the room and, you know, they're doing what they need to do and just making sure that I'm okay. And one nurse said, um, you know, I can let you sleep when I change bags, but if you want me to, I can wake you up. I said, it's the first time I'd really like you to wake me up. I just wanted to know that they were checking, and I just felt better just knowing what was going on a little bit. I was very cognizant of everything the whole time, and I know there's patients who aren't, and I know that there's patients who probably just aren't concerned. <laughs> But I think chemo is really serious drug, so. I don't know if I get all the chemo medication at one time. I do not. Or I'm in the port thing in and also, well, and the stage two is like how much there is and it's one side of the diaphragm. And the E is that there's at least a, one growth near vessels and the bulky is there's one large growth and it is a big one. Um, so that's how they name it specifically. And the bone marrow biopsy could come back and say that I'm stage four. And either way, the treatment is the same. And so we are starting treatment today. Three types of chemo, a bone marrow booster, three steroids, which I think some of those are oral, pre-meds. The pre-meds are the things that, pre-medications are things that help you cope with the, um, the chemo. I got an anti-nausea and a pre-med. I don't know if Rituxan is a pre-med. I'm not, I mean, I get it before chemo, but it's to make chemo more effective. And there's a couple steroids that were pushes, and then I had prednisone. There's one steroid, it burns so bad if they do it too fast. Hope it didn't happen to you. Happen to me. <laughs> like anti emetic medicine? I get growth hormone injections, maybe. I think that depends on my insurance. It was insurance, nice. and the hospital is helping me through all of that, and the emotions as they come along, and I am embracing the reality of this. Um, I'm not, you know, I did accept cancer like pretty much right away, and it was helpful to me that someone that I, I just completed this spiritual class with, I messaged the other four ladies that were in there with me. So there were five of us, and we just created this text group the last day of the class. And uh, I don't know, probably a few days later is when I texted them and said, I, I don't know, I just feel like I want to tell you this. I guess I got diagnosed with lymphoma. And one of them texted me separately and said, this is your path. And I know that, you know what I mean? I know that, and I needed somebody to say that so I could bring that to the front of my mind. And it was so helpful to take the view that there's not somewhere else I'm supposed to be. My body's not supposed to be some other way. This is exactly where I'm meant to be and what I'm supposed to be doing. And there is something coming. Something I'm going to get out of this. And that's really what I brought forth. I didn't, I didn't use that to cover up other experiences, you know, emotions, thoughts, or anything. I mean, if the thoughts came, whatever they were, I just was like, okay, that's what I'm thinking about right now. Okay, that's where my emotions are right now. And it just, I did not use that, this is my path to like, not deal with stuff. And I could see how that might happen for some people like this, like a, 
in times of struggle may be just, nope, oh, this is my path. Just going to be okay with it, even when they're not. No, when I wasn't okay with it, I just was okay with not being okay with it. There were lots of times like but the underlying, the undercurrent of the whole thing was, this is my path. This is it. This is my life. This is it. Without significance, without judgment about it. And if I did put significance or I did have judgment, just noticed it and let it be there. And I think that's important because it's easy to push away that something is bothering you. Be like, yeah, I don't have time for that. I got I'm dealing with chemo and cancer. Or I got this family member that I got to deal with, or, you know, we could push it away with a lot of reasons. Not in shock anymore. I think I'm not in shock anymore. It's just, I might have still been in shock a little bit there. Um, maybe less than the very beginning. But I think there was some level of emotional shock for maybe another week. Say that because I don't know for sure. <laughs> but, um, there is something about being excerpted from my life and being in a hospital and not being in my actual life that has some kind of cushion. I'm going to correct what I said there. I was in my actual life in the hospital, but what I meant was in my normal routine, my typical routine, I think there would have been some things that were harder about that. But I was really like, okay, this is my typical routine. I was like, we're going to do this now. <laughs> and I think that was helpful in some ways. I miss my kids, I miss my wife, I want to go home, and there is some benefit to being here, and that is that I get to be here and focus on me and allow um, myself to just get treatment, and I think there's a beautiful benefit to that. And it gives me space to think, it gives me space to just kind of <laughs> be with how I feel. Yes, yeah, so space to think. Day two, I was like, I'm retiring from massage. <laughs> done. And I thought at that same day, I was like, I think that I'll probably retire from classroom teaching and go back to my practice of Chinese medicine. You know, I closed my practice and really not too long after I was in the hospital. And then I officially closed by November 30th, 2021. I had cleared out my space. And then somewhere in there, I was like, what is near and dear to my heart is teaching. It may not be in the classroom. It may be another route of teaching. But I'm pretty sure that's what I'm here to do. So yes, time to clear my head, very helpful. And like that I'm aware that there is a growth in my abdomen. I can feel it without touching my abdomen. I know it's there. I'm uncomfortable sometimes. Sometimes there's pain. I am in great appreciation of pain medications in a way that I've never been. I've never had this kind of pain. Uh, the daily pain is not bad. What got me in the hospital was a 10. And I'm so grateful for pain medications for that. It was worse at night. Um, I am grateful that medicine knows how to handle this. They know what to look for. They've got their markers for what should be and what should not be. They've got so many ways to figure out where you are. And of course, no person with cancer is the same as another person. <sighs> Days of prednisone are the worst. Oh, may the light shine upon us all. Mm. We are children of the light. You are a child of the light. I am a child of the light. Mm. That was a year ago. And my hair started falling out right away. Okay, let's check out another one. There's the hair cutting one. Let's skip to this second one. Hairlessness. All right, so I am heading, let me just tell you, bald, I look like my mother's side of the family, the men. <laughs> I remember thinking that, and then my mom said something, like, she, I don't want to offend you, but you're looking like a Ramsey right now. <laughs> I'm like, I know. And then my brother was like, you look like, I think he said I look like Papa. I was like, oh my God, tell me about it. Because if the hair was less sparse, maybe it would be different. But my hair was so sparse, so I mean, I just, I would look at it and be like, just look like a balding old man. <laughs> first day out after the great shave. Into a store for the first time with this bald head. It's not bald, but 
it's not a buzz cut either because although the picture the video so that sparseness is what tells people that that ain't just some chosen haircut yeah that's a person dealing with something look at all those eyebrows look at those eyelashes mm, they're back actually I look pretty good in the video but there's not a lot of hair on this head and that's the part Skip. mostly uneventful eye contact seem different could be my hair maybe it's just me I remember I don't know if it was this particular shopping trip where I had to stop and get some stuff or it was after but um I remember distinctly like somebody like looking at me to talk to me and like immediately like looking at something else and I was like I know I mean what you gonna do <laughs> it's not if you see somebody covering up their bald head every day so on this drive I'm actually going to see my acupuncturist for the first time I meet him for the first time so let's just skip here whoa so here's the part I don't like see how there's some hair in there I want that hair to be gone I want to just my skin my skin tone still looks okay my eyes are bright I think my fall out I can't shave it like flat I think I mentioned this in a video before I can't like take a big to it it's still in there like if I pull it's in there <laughs> uh, weird. But, so you can see that it's falling out over here the back's pretty bald I don't know if you can... this side's pretty much the same so that's what's happening with the hair. My two favorite scarves so far came from And so that looks kind of weird. It's that part I, I was like, I need my head to match the rest of me a little bit better. And I think I'm just going to go out and try to get like 10 minutes on my head. It's interesting because in the video you can't tell, but in person where my hair was looked like such a pale, pale, pale color. It just was so obviously a fresh hair cut. <laughs> So there's that. This is those videos were still in the first two rounds of chemo. Two. I'm just gonna skip to after chemo number two. The day after chemo number two. Good morning. I just woke up. It's about 7:30. Um, this is the first day after chemo round two. Holy shit, I'm puffy. Real puffy. And reddish. I look red. And I thought I'd tell you how I was feeling and show you what my morning is like. Uh, I usually wake up before everybody, but sometimes I stay in bed and sleep after everybody, but prednisone makes it hard to sleep, so I didn't sleep very good last night. I'm pretty tired. Uh, so round two of prednisone. I'm pretty sure that's the, uh, the round that we, I couldn't sleep and Chrissy couldn't sleep and we assembled an Ikea <laughs> storage unit for homeschool. <laughs> Well, uh, that's the end of me watching videos. I did record some more, but I can't find the video for that. So we'll just say that's it. Um, we're getting into October now, and it's taken me a while to get to this video because I've just had some work to do and some class prep and stuff. So um, it's coming to you a little bit later than I intended, but I guess that doesn't really matter. Um, I do want to share with you that tomorrow I have a follow-up CAT scan and I had like some abdominal discomfort. It was um, nothing like, you know, what I had going on back when I had cancer, but boy, did I get emotional about it. It was just a feeling I've never had and, um, um, you know, I guess it takes a while for that concern to go away. And so I just was like, okay, pain, what is this about? What do you want me to know? <laughs> and it brought up a few um, concerns that I have. Maybe, I don't know if I should call them concerns as much as just things I want to improve on. You know? So, anyway. To share that with you. I'll get the results of my CAT scan on Monday. Today, tomorrow will be Friday, so very quickly. Uh, interestingly, my mom is also dealing with a kind of cancer called MDS. She looks at her CAT scans and stuff, and I don't look at mine. I think I've just always known that looking at it would just bring me anxiety, and I, I confirmed that 
when somebody in the lymphoma group on Facebook put their CAT scan up or their PET scan or whatever it was. And I was just like, yep, I just definitely don't need to see any of those. I don't even need to see hers. <laughs> There's something about it that really just, nope, I'll pass. <laughs> um, so that, yeah. And I'll do like a sort of a regular update here soon. And uh, just, you know, life update, health update. What am I doing? Update. So there's that. You know, this is a longer video than usual. And I, I really do truly thank you for watching. And I do love you. And I do wish that your life is wonderful. Talk to you soon.